Hello, and welcome to Strange Dominions, where we attempt to unlock the mysteries behind the unseen and unheard, unknown and unknowable. I am your host, Octavian Graves. And I'm your co-host, Ian Burton. Tonight, we are speaking with J. Allen Cross. J. is a practitioner of witchcraft and... Paranormal investigator that utilizes his craft in his work. Yes. He has written two books, American Brujeria and The Witch's Guide to the Paranormal. We speak about his upbringing and his beginnings in magic and the paranormal, some of his techniques that he uses with witchcraft and on paranormal investigations, some uh, different spirits that he has encountered, and other strange encounters that he has had while doing this work. Yep, and now, now it's kind of a it's kind of a treat to get him on because what he does and has been doing is exactly kind of why we're doing this podcast. Really. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, definitely a, a very big cross section in this show is uh, magic and the paranormal. So I'm a very uh, apt to have him on. Yep, and that's and honestly, we might not have he might have a little different ways than we would do it, which is why it's great to have him on here. But you know, we're going to be going out and doing rituals and our own investigations and utilizing magic to do that and we might even use some of his techniques just to see how they work and yeah and uh i know he's going to go into a little bit of the different kinds of spirits that you might encounter at in a paranormal investigation or in a haunted location and if you were doing traditional paranormal investigations we think that this book would be of absolute value to you and some of his techniques would be a very very good asset to you on your investigations as always, if you've seen something strange, such as a cryptid, spirit, UFO, or anything in between, please send us an email at strangedominionspodcast at gmail.com for your chance to be on the show. If you're enjoying the content we're making and would like to get extra content, you can become a patron starting at just $4 a month. With that, you get content, merchandise, and the ability to be on the show to talk about some of your own experiences. The show notes will have all of his links and our Patreon in them as well. Without further ado... We bring you our interview with J. Allen Cross. All right, tonight I have with me my new co host, Ian Burton. Hey guys, how are you? And J. Allen Cross, who is a witch, paranormal investigator, and author of the new book, Witch's Guide to the Paranormal. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. We are very excited to have you on. Definitely. So, I guess we'll just start with the most obvious question. How did you get into the paranormal and witchcraft? Ah, so for me, they kind of started about the same time. Um, I grew up in a in a magical family, which I I don't mean to give the impression that I grew up with a full you know magical education from my parents or my family lineage, but we all had stuff going on. <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up in a family where you know people would get upset and then pipes would burst and things like that. So that was something that was kind of uh, happening to me at a very young age. And around that time as well, when I was a little kid, um, around the age of seven-ish, I went through what I call uh, my download. And that was a period of about 10 days, two weeks, where I would have a splitting migraine every night and my parents had no idea what to do. I just have these memories of me lying on the ground, clutching my head and them trying to feed me those like grape chewable Tylenols that you <laughs> give children. Um, and then one day it just stopped. After which I began to have dreams that would then come true of like places I hadn't been before. And then I would show up and at them suddenly like a couple weeks later, maybe a month later. Um, and so I began realizing, you know, Oh, there's, there's something to this. So I was kind of like, okay, like I, I figured out I was psychic pretty young. Um, the witch thing also figured that out pretty young. Um, but it wasn't until I was in my teens that I made the mistake of saying, well, I'm so glad I just, you know, have the dreams. and I'm not one of those people that like sees dead folk and <laughs> the universe has a sense of humor. So that was what definitely. Me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And so I always had a 
big sense of responsibility when it came to this type of thing. I never thought that it was just a coincidence or an accident that I had this stuff going on. Um, so what I ended up doing was I figured I, I have to use this. There, it's been given to me for a reason. So I joined the paranormal investigation situation pretty early on. Uh, I was in high school when I started doing it and I started doing it myself. And since at that point I already had a bit of a magical education, it just seemed natural to combine the two. So I began doing that from pretty much my first investigation in high school. Yeah. That, that mirrors kind of how I got started both on a deeper magical level and, you know, just throughout life at that time. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I don't know, this is something that I always think about a little bit, like when you're younger, like the formative years, like, you know, when you're still transitioning, maybe you're like a young teen or, um, you know, even maybe an older teen or young adult. But basically when you first right before into kind of your first initiation or download, so to speak, when you really when the universe pulls you in and it's saying, hey, play with me and you're mm -hmm. still confused. Um, I, I always feel like maybe you agree like there's just. Sorry, I had to edit that part out. I'm sorry. I was thinking okay. of a question. Um, let me come back to it, okay? Okay. So the um, the book is really cool. I like the way it's written. And I'm curious about what the motivation was behind actually writing a book instead of giving a class or something like that. Mm. Yes, I... Um have thought about doing this in workshop form um, many times, but the thing is, is that in order to teach everything in this book at the level that it would need to be taught, um, it would have to be a several month course to really kind of get through it um, because it's something that has so much nuance to it. There's a lot of in and outs to it. Um, and I have taught like things like negative entity removals in a workshop setting, but even then you can only cover so much. So it was important for me not only to be able to put this into a book, but, you know, m giving it to people in a way that they can refer back to it whenever they need to carry it with them whenever they need to. And I figured as a book, I could in a way be with everybody. Um, as they went on this journey themselves. So I could kind of still accompany them. If they needed to ask a question, they can look at the book. Um, so it was a little bit of a way for me to just kind of put myself out into the world and sort of mentor people from a distance if I could. Um, and the reason why I decided that this book needed to be a thing was because, um, you know, given my upbringing and my approach to paranormal investigation, I, for some reason, had assumed that everybody else had this education as well. And when I joined a paranormal investigation team and started to interact with other investigation teams, I realized that this was actually not a thing, that people were not being taught, you know, these magical techniques. People weren't being taught how to open the light so that earthbound spirits could go through. Um, they weren't being taught how to protect themselves, you know, and... I was kind of shocked by it. And when people would contact me from out of state, when I would be um, far away and not able to help them, uh, they <laughs> I contact their local paranormal investigation team. You know, you get on Google, you find their local paranormal investigation team. I'd send them an email like, hey, these people are experiencing this type of activity. Can you go like fix it for them? Like actually do something about the activity so that they can stop, you know, all sleeping in the living room together. <laughs> um, and if I got a response from the team, 98% of the time, the response was, well, we can't actually do anything, but I'd love to come out and take photos. And I'm like, that's not helpful. That's not what these people need. Like, I, I, I appreciate the search for evidence, but we have to understand that people need more. And not everybody needs somebody to go on safari in their home. They need, they need help. And that's what I'm hoping to provide with this book is to give people the tools to actually enter the arena of paranormal investigation and then uh, do what we call on my team a, a resolve to resolve a haunting. Because, you know, cleansing, like it's, the house isn't dirty. Sometimes the house is dirty. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's not always about cleaning the house as much as it is, um, you know, reaching a resolution. 
That's awesome. I think that's really helpful and a, a big turn in the thinking in paranormal investigation because a, for a long time, it really was, we don't have a solution for you, but if you let us come investigate and get evidence, then maybe in 30, 40 years, then we may have a solution for everybody. And that right. just doesn't help. That's not practical. There's no way of uh, reassuring someone with that kind of advice. So mm -hmm. this book is really valuable, I think. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. And one of the things that I asked you before we got on was what the reception was like between the witch community and the paranormal community. Mm, yeah. Well, so what's that been like? It's been really interesting because, you know, and I talk about this in the book a little bit as well, that the witchcraft community and the paranormal investigation community have long been, you know, parallel, but decidedly separate parties. Um, you know, the paranormal investigation community often really likes to reject anything that's spiritual or kind of not super scientific, which always flabbergasts me. It's like, <laughs> you, you know, especially when you're working with, you know, something like the paranormal to to reject things like psychics or, you know, things like that always, always, always kind of gets me. Um, but then at the same time, witches tend to very much look down their nose at paranormal investigation. Um, and it's been very interesting to see both of the worlds kind of start to pick up this book and see what's happening. So far, the reception has been, I would say, probably a little bit more enthusiastic from the paranormal investigation side, because a lot of the people um, do tend to have a bit of open-mindedness or are already doing kind of something similar to what I'm doing. And what I'm receiving from a, a lot of the feedback from paranormal investigators is, well, I have been doing witchcraft forever, but I never even thought to put them together. And I'm like, aha, <laughs> yes. And so they're like, I didn't, why did I never connect those dots? And so a lot of people are connecting it over there. And I do think that it is getting witches more interesting, uh, more interested in the work. So right now, I've, I, I apparently am making a, a occult career of creating bridges between worlds that have decidedly been separate for a really long time, whether that's between like, you know, Mexican American culture or, um, you know, things like, uh, the paranormal investigation and witchcraft worlds, but I'm kind of smashing them together. And so far it's, it's going well, it's piquing a lot of people's interest. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause you're kind of acting almost as like a, uh, an intermediary spirit. Little bit, little bit. And I'm curious, you know, one of the things, which witchcraft, I've known about it my entire life, but I didn't really start researching it or getting into the practice of it until probably a couple months ago. I've been very involved in what we would call old world grimoire magic and ceremonial magic. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you've had any contact with either ceremonial magicians or like chaos magicians or just any other kind of magic practitioner that doesn't define themselves as a witch and what if they've given you any feedback or you know interest in the book. Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't think in those specific terms, I don't think I have. I've come across them like in, in the field. Um, I've come across like ceremonial magicians and things like that and had conversations. Um, but I haven't had anyone who's been like, you know, like a golden dawn in a shoot or something like that, who's gotten my book and, and has thoughts or anything like that. I haven't, I haven't gotten to that yet. Um, Especially, I would be curious as well, because my approach to a lot of the work um, is very practical. I'm, I'm a folk magician, first and foremost. Um, so the, the work that I do tends to be very simple, um, very straightforward. So as far as like big rituals are concerned, there's, there's not a lot of that happening in the book. Um, so I, I'd be curious. Yeah, absolutely. Ian, you had something? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... So I would consider myself kind of in my path. I'm, I'm a mixed bag, also like you. And again, your your new book is in the mail, but I've been spending a lot of time listening to you on pod, on your podcasts, oh. on other episodes and writing. And I, I, I have to say, I absolutely love your attitude and take. And this is kind of from somebody who has spent a lot of time with Golden Dawn material and a lot of time in like the Chaos Kid circles and witchcraft. And again, I'm a mixed bag, but your emphasis on... DIY, do-it-yourself magic, but coming from a place of skill and purpose is really impressive to me and functional. And that's a, kind of an approach I've always taken it to. And I was listening to you, I think it was um, on the Witches of the End Times podcast. Mm, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good one. And just I, I, it stuck with me, your conversation about, you know, you don't always have the things you might need in, in a, you know, best possible situation as a witch. You might not have that materia. You might not have the tools you need. And that, I think, personally, the fact that you've come and you are now sharing that saying, hey, hey, you you sometimes have everything you need right here. And mm-hmm. that is something that I've felt, too. I've, I've been in the field in much the same way, even as an investigator and a magician, and, and realized that, you know, it's almost like a lesson the universe is like, hey, if you want to call it the universe or your spirits or your guides, but mm-hmm. sometimes you come up with something that's very serious and potentially dangerous and involving other people, and you don't have those things you can rely on. And that's, it, to me, it almost felt like a push, like, hey, have a little more confidence in yourself. You really do have this power, and right. it's coming from you. And those tools may make it a little easier or better or more functional, but... I, don't know, I just wanted to emphasize that do it yourself that you've kind of been peppering through the interview so far. And but you said you're you're a folk witch and mm-hmm. an investigator. And he was talking about some more traditional forms of kind of almost like Western magic. On that point, I know that in the uh, the beginning of the book, you talk a lot about it, will and intent and mental magic Mm -hmm. and that uh, i'll be honest it took me a bit to swallow because within the grimoire community uh it's not so much about uh the magician having power but more the magician being able to call on spirits that do have the power and Mm -hmm. i'm and it it was just very interesting for me to read about your approach uh with will and intent and i'm curious about at what point did you realize that that was your driving force, that, that it wasn't so much about, you know, the spirits doing the work, but it really was coming from you? That was something I had to learn pretty early on. And, you know, everyone kind of approaches the path of magic and witchcraft differently. Um, but that was something that I, that I was taught pretty early on. It was the idea of, of moving and directing energy um, on my own, which I, I think is important. Now, now, as a worker, I do lean a lot on spirits and their help. But I I think having that grounded foundation and being able to be like, you know, sometimes the spirits are busy. Sometimes you don't know which spirits to work with at this moment. Sometimes you have, you know, a dead person in your home and they need to not be in your home. Um, so really kind of putting the power back in people's hands, especially with things like mental magic, um, is really helpful in this work. Because uh, kind of like what, what Ian was talking about, you know, sometimes you're in the field and you don't have everything that you need. So being able to do it with just sheer intention and remembering that, like, you know, I'm not one of those people that's like, you know, you are the magic. There is no magic in the tools because I there there is magic in the tools. I think that's important to remember. Um, but to remember that we ourselves are a spirit, and a soul inhabiting a body um, the same way that spirits are inhabiting plants and rocks and things like that. Um, We can utilize our our own force to do these things. And I'm actually kind of surprised. I was very braced for the community to uh, have a lot of backlash. The fact that a great deal of the work in this book is mental magic because again you you can't always have everything that you need in you know these situations um but i'm very glad that people have been uh open to that and i I think a lot of times people are afraid of things like mental magic because number one we've come to really rely on tools and mental magic is not very instagrammable so we don't see it very often um and also, I think people are a little afraid of it because it creates a separation. Because when you are practicing alone in your home with your candles and stuff, if your spell coincidentally works, that's great. But when you're put into a setting where it's like, okay, now close this portal and we should be able to see active change after you do it, that scares people, I think. Because they're not, because suddenly they, they have to prove that they can actually do this. And I think that that can be intimidating. But that's also why I I walk people through in the book, here's how to do it. Not just like sink or swim, good luck, but kind of like we're going to start from the very beginning so that you can feel comfortable doing this, which I I think is kind of important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Have you gotten any kind of, uh, I guess, feedback from people who've read the book and feel that it's very hard for them that, you know, some of the exercises in the book, they've tried them and they're just, they're not getting the results that you talk about in the book. 
Not yet. Um, and I think that's partially because I... I know the book's very new. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sure it will happen at some point. Um, but I, I really wanted to approach this work as well because um, in in a way that I felt was inclusive because a lot of the way that we used to talk about um, this work, especially with things like visualization, didn't take into account the fact that a lot of people have difficulty with visualization. Um, and where I do think it is a learned skill, a lot of people think that they have that syndrome or whatever where you can't visualize. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It was an aphantasia or something like that. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people think that they have that, and and I think they just aren't practiced enough at it because it is a skill that you have to work at. Um, but also some people do have it. And so what, what do you do if you can't visualize or you find it frustrating? So I wanted to give people like, okay, if that's something that's not, you know, helpful for you, what else can you do? So I tried to approach it kind of giving people a few ways to come about it so that they didn't feel like they were stuck with only one way to do it, which I think is going to be helpful for a lot of folks. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely one of the people that's uh, victim to difficulties with visualization. It took me a long mm -hmm. time to even get into meditation. That was very difficult. Um, and now I feel that I'm somewhat uh, okay at it. I'm, I, I still wonder if I'm even doing it right. <laughs> what even is right, though? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's a really cool concept. And I think a lot, and it feels very workable and, and adaptable. And I think a lot of people would do well to not only you know try it your way, but also experiment with other ways, uh, you know, that's still rooted in the mental magic system, but also kind of adapting it to their own. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about when when you're on an investigation, and I know that you have your own team. What has been like in the early days? Did were they was the rest of your team very comfortable with what you were doing, or was there any kind of pushback to that? I have been blessed with a very understanding team. Um, and I don't know uh, if you notice very, uh, the the dedication page in the book is, the book is dedicated to my team uh, specifically because they have from the beginning really trusted me, believed in me, um, and gave me the room to do a lot of experimentation <laughs> when it comes to this. Uh, because I... I think it helped too that I had to audition to get on the team. They took me to a place I'd never been before that was haunted. And I had to tell them everything that had been there and, you know, what had happened there and all that. And so I, I think proving myself when I first started was really helpful to kind of get them to be like, okay, he knows what he's doing. Um, but then after that, they really gave me the space and were very open-minded to letting me try what I needed to try. Um, which was a huge part in helping me, come about with a lot of the stuff in this book um, was just simply trial and error <laughs> over the time. Um, and I, I work on a very special team as well because my team is mostly made up of psychics. Um, and we have, we do have investigators. We do do in, like your classic style of investigation, but we are mostly spiritual people who are there to help fix hauntings um, in whatever way that we can. So that's something that I, feel helped as well because they we were all there to do the same thing they were very open-minded about it and so i thought that was very helpful yeah absolutely um one of the interesting things that i found in this book in the beginning is understanding the symbol system mm -hmm. and i'm curious because you know when i have done my magic i get very disappointed when i don't get some sort of very external effect but mm -hmm. reading this, I started to, you know, go back and think about uh, my experiences and my rituals and things like that and realizing that some of the things that were just coming to mind were my, maybe something else that was, uh, you know, using my subconscious and, and my my mental bank of images and, and thoughts uh, to, to manifest to me specifically. And I'm curious mm -hmm. kind of what your experience has been with that and how you kind of came to that as a, as a system of contact? Absolutely. So um, I study um, 
you know, being being a medium, I, I study what they call mental mediumship, which is kind of your your most common form. It's what we see with like um, Tyler Henry and Teresa Caputo and all them. Um, it's 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 mental mediumship and. Through that, um, you do have to learn the symbol system because that is often how spirit communicates with us. And and what I mean by the symbol system is um, when you're doing mediumship, mediumship is uh, can be very difficult. And it requires a lot of energy for both you and the spirit. So the spirits are going to try and communicate with you as much information as they can using as little as they can. And so... But that can also be a little difficult because sometimes a spirit hands you an orange and that could mean that they uh, worked in an orange grove. It could also mean Florida or Orange County. And so as a medium, it can be very difficult to um, parse out which one they mean. I, I remember watching this interview with Teresa Caputo that she was talking about her symbols and she talks about them a lot when she does her readings. She'll be like, he's he has doves in his hand, which means that he you know, died in tragedy. And one of her symbols that she was talking about, she's like, one of my symbols is a horse, which means that they were in the military or they were from Rhode Island. <laughs> I am actually from Rhode Island. <laughs> oh, right. Well, there you go. Perfect. Sure, sure, um, sure. So when it comes to the symbol system, spirits will, and and that what's hard is that there is no set symbol system where for everybody this means this. Um, so it, we can't really transpose each other's symbol systems. We have to learn our own because they're going to utilize our memories and things that we've already had in, we've been in contact with to try and, get that response for us. So that was something I had to learn very early on, especially um, when I started doing one-on-one -on -one mediumship readings that were not in like a, um, like a paranormal setting, like when I'm actually sitting down with somebody and, and speaking to their dead folk. Um, that was something that was very difficult for me and continues to be difficult for me as I try and figure out, you know, what this means. And sometimes you trip over it. So, uh, for instance, I had a lot of spirits that were handing me rosaries. And I was like, oh, so they're Catholic. And they're like, no. Um, <laughs> and then I realized, I'm like, oh, this is my symbol for Catholic, but it's also my symbol for they were Latino or, or Mexican, specifically. Uh, or similarly, I would see a hospital. And I'd be like, oh, so they were in, in the hospital near the end. And they'd be like, no, but they were sick. So it takes a minute to kind of figure it out. And also, like, they'll use things as well that you're familiar with. So one of, the, um, one of the stories that I tell in the book is there was one time where I was doing a reading for somebody, and uh, Virginia Madsen sits down at the table with us, and I'm like, Virginia Madsen is uh, still alive, so what's going on here? But if I described Virginia Madsen, you know, um, female, about this age, pretty, curly blonde hair, um, you know, I would be describing this person's friend. So even if I wasn't seeing specifically that spirit, they could show me somebody that if I described them, um, then... That would that would be the symbol of, of what they look like. Or similarly, if I'm reading for somebody and a spirit that looks identical to them sits down, like that there's like a, a like a, a double of them suddenly, that's my sign that they get told a lot that they look like this person. Like, oh, you get told all the time that you look like your your grandma who passed, you know, when she was younger. And they're like, Oh yeah, everyone's constantly like, Wow, you're the spitting image of, you know, so and so. <laughs> so the symbols can be very broad, <laughs> but they can be helpful when you figure them out. Yeah, I know that symbols can be very broad, and uh, it figuring out can be hard. I know that it took me a long time to even get around to like contemplating that concept of you know my mental symbols being a representation of something by an external force. And I'm curious, when you're on an investigation, do you ever find that people who can see spirits, uh, like if you get an image in your head, and then you're with someone who can actually see a spirit in the physical, do does your image line up with what they're seeing or is there any kind of like uh, correlation there? Yeah. Um, that definitely does happen. And I love it when that happens too, because that's fun. Um, and I tell this story in the book as well. I'm, I'm telling all the, all the book stories here. Um, there, 
when we went to um, Montgomery House in Washington, which was very, uh, very haunted, I went with uh, a paranormal investigation team that, that isn't mine. I went with um, the lovely ladies of Hella Paranormal. Um, they were invited to do the first investigation there after it had become a private residence. And so they invited me to go along and I was very excited about it. And when I went there, the first thing I noted, noticed upon wa- walking in was so you walk through the door and there's this big staircase immediately. And at the top of it is the spirit of this woman. And she's in this like old style dress, hair up in a bun, very severe looking. And I'm just kind of like, while everyone's kind of greeting the family, I'm just kind of looking at the spirit like, okay, hey, like, excellent. Like she, she was not super happy that we were there. She didn't know who we were. We were strangers. And my friend Z is standing next to me and she does automatic drawing. And she has her phone out and she's like scribbling on it with a stylus. And I'm like, and I look down and she's drawing the exact same woman that I'm seeing. Like down to the color of the dress, the style of dress. Like it was weird (laughs) to see that. Um, So yeah, it does happen. And it's really neat too when we go on investigations because like I said, I'm not the only psychic there. So it's me and several other people. And so they'll often have... um, you know, we'll compare notes on on what we're getting. And sometimes we'll get the exact same thing. Sometimes we'll be perceiving the spirit in different stages. So sometimes one of us will be contacting the spirit when they were uh, in a slightly younger place. And the other one will be speaking with them in a slightly older place, but it will be the same spirit. But time, time is weird, (laughs) especially on, especially when you're dead. So (laughs) that's what it seems like spirits, whether they're of, human origin or non-human origin uh something that you know that that's something that perhaps some of them they don't understand how our time works humans human spirits obviously do a little better though they might be a little more displaced in their sense of it at least till they get the hang of things uh, from their side but um in my experience with inhuman spirits um and not necessarily the negative ones ever i think it's different for different spirits but uh, I've gotten the impression that they have to kind of learn how we operate and view in time, like mm-hmm. when we meet in that middle time. So it's almost like a a lot of people don't think of spirits having learning experiences. But in my experience, they do like. Yes. And, um, you know, you were talking about symbols early and how earlier and how important that is, whether really you're doing magic or on a psychic or mediumship level. Um you know, again, I keep saying my experience, but that seems to be how spirits communicate in general. They don't need language in the same way that we do. And mm-hmm. again, I was seeing your thoughts on it, but it's almost like they communicate since they don't really have senses in the same way somebody in a human body does. They kind of just project that intent. That is how they communicate. They have that idea. They give it to you. Mm-hmm. And when you get on that level... It's it's sometimes hard for a person who's just used to, you know, the regular senses in the world that they don't have to explain something in the English language or the Spanish language. Like it's that intent they're coming through. The spirits, like, um, they can just, they kind of know it. I was almost given once kind of a download from several spirits at different times because I asked, like, I was curious, like, how do you see me? How do you mm-hmm. feel my communication is? And and I kind of got this vision, if you will, of they see us kind of, and I don't know if it's for every spirit, but kind of like a blob of not light, but equivalently like light and sound, but mostly like mm-hmm. intent. It just kind of comes out. And what you were saying about you know, saying they're, you know, projecting the symbol of an orange and it could mean all kinds of different things. But that is almost like the easiest way they can do it. They're just saying, hey, I'm trying to give you a very simple message because I'm getting yours. And if I may add something that maybe, you know, to see what you think about. um, It's our brain farting all the time over here. But what do you think about spirits in talking about spirits in human language like do you think and this might be a little off base but i feel like it's relevant say say you're trying to get from a spirit whether just through a divination tool or uh, just through communicating on a psychic level 
if you need if you need information that requires like english words for instance english or spanish and say if you need a specific name written out in letters um have you ever found that it's difficult for spirits to translate their intent to um like our alphabet or our language system when they are used to themselves communicating in symbols or just purely intent based have you ever had experience with that and how have you gotten around it or what does the spirit kind of convey to you its situation was do you understand what i'm saying like say if you need yeah. like a town name or a specific person name or even you know a spirit's name translated into something you can write down mm-hmm. But have you ever had it where, like, the spirit kind of understands what you're saying, but then it then has a little bit of confusion on translating that's like spelling out a a word or a name? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of mediums have difficulty with hyper-specific things. Like, Mm -hmm. names can be very hard. So you'll often see psychics, even even very talented mediums, um, will be things like, oh, like, they have a G name. You know, um, instead of being like, their name is Gregory, because like that's that's very difficult for them to kind of like really laser focus down on because you're right. They do kind of communicate to you intent. And it kind of depends as well what kind of a psychic you are, because I um, am very heavily uh, what they call clairsentient, which means a lot of it comes through as feeling. So I get a lot of emotions. I get a lot of I, I can feel what they mean, but then I have to articulate it in a way that is accurate which can be difficult um so for me if i'm getting like a like a name i don't really get like oh their name is uh like stacy but i will get like their name is like kind of like this Susie, stacy sarah kind of ballpark like i'll, I'll get like the flavor <laughs> of it and um usually i'll i'll be i'll be correct like it's it's something like that um like or 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 like a, a Josh or a John or like one of those four letter J names, you know, like um so you can get kind of you can kind of parse it down a little bit. Um but I, I think it is important that you bring up this idea of how they perceive us because we're so very much obsessed with this idea of, you know, how do we contact them? How do we do this? But this is a team effort in order to make this contact happen. Um, there was a book that came out, I believe, either the late 70s or, or possibly in the 80s. I can't remember. Um, it, it was a vel- very well-known book back then, but I find a lot of people don't know about it these days. Um, it's a book by Sanaya Rahman and Dwayne Packer called Opening to Channel. And it's about channeling your guides, like doing the actual act of channeling. And what's interesting is a great deal of the book, I would say about half of the book, is channeled from their guides. So they had their guides write several chapters. And it describes from their point of view what it is like to interact with us and how they um, connect with us from their point of view, which is very helpful because you get to see like oh, okay so this is what they're doing this is what they need from us so it kind of like um especially when it comes to channeling they can reach toward us or we can reach towards them as much as we need to but unless we're both doing it at the same time and meeting in the middle then that connection doesn't really form um so learning what it's like for them can be very important when it comes to psychic work um so i definitely remember or i definitely uh, encourage people to to find that book cuz it's fascinating you know i've heard of that the book you're talking about in the subject matter i haven't thought about that book in a long time i don't own it but it's going in my collection because that's that's a big focus of what i'm interested in exploring in terms of spirit work which is a big part of what i do too and you know just listening to you now and some of your other work uh not only been val in you know extremely validating but informative and you just don't in my in my experience you just don't see a lot of work or effort put out towards the spirit's point of view, so to speak, or the mm-hmm. moment or the uh, the communication between spirit and medium or spirit and, you know, anybody working with them. And I think that's incredibly important. Like, in a, and, and to me, I, I believe in, you know, kind of a middle ground, but generally spirits are objective intelligences of their own right. Um, specifically, you know, spirits that have once been human, of course. And, 
you know, you see a lot of books on kind of how to contact spirits, how to talk to them, what, you know, how to get things from them or how to control them in some way. Mm -hmm. But to me, like, if, if you believe that spirits are independent, willful entities of whatever origin, then your next recourse, like, this is me and how I deal with people, you should deal with them as people too. You see, how do they see you? How do they communicate? What is mm -hmm. easiest for them? Because if you can match that on um, on the level, then that is going to give you the best possible work you can do, especially when you are trying to get some practical results. You're an Absolutely. investigator, and you're going to houses where you know people often need help, and oftentimes the spirit is probably confused too, and also on some level needs help. And I guess at the end of the day, you want to get that cleared out as painlessly and efficiently as possible for the best result for both parties, mm -hmm. you know, assuming it's not something dark and vile, yeah, but, right. and even then, but in the other direction. So understanding how that spirit is viewing you as a medium or viewing you as a magician, being able to take its message and be coherent and understand it and see where it's coming from. And even, you know, the world that it's kind of existing in, in that space, aside from the human space. Now, can I ask you a question? Sure. It's kind of on the idea and topic of things from the spirit's point of view. Um, have you ever done communication work, your medium, so you have with spirits? How would you say, do you think there's a difference between, say, human-based spirits, non-human-based spirits, whether dark or otherwise, and, you know, we kind of believe in the gamut. There's a very large and vibrant spirit, spiritual ecology in the world and reality. Do you think spirits of different types exist in different spaces, so to speak? Like, the spirits that were once human, do you think they, and I don't, I don't want to say words like vibrational level, but maybe different different foundations from where they come from like would you say a nature spirit exists in the same kind of ethereal or astral or spiritual space as say a member of the human dead or a greater spirit uh, like a diamond or do you, do you see what i'm asking do you think they all kind of exist in the same plane or realm where they can interact do you think they kind of exist in different ecosystems and can kind of communicate through us in our world? I think it depends. Um, I, I definitely think it depends because I have ran into um, human spirits that I would say are both like earthbound human spirits. Um, like they're both, you know, dead people that are still here on our side. Um, sometimes do not are not aware of one another because of where they're at personally. Um, and so I, I do think it is, has to do a little bit with things like that people call like, you know, vibrational levels or, or whatever. Um, because sometimes like if I have a spirit um, that either isn't aware that they're dead or they might be caught in a memory or something like that, um, they'll be next to a bunch of other spirits that are all interacting with one another, but this one will not know or see them, or they won't be able to be seen by the other and tell no, them, yeah. hey, you are dead, and then and then they kind of go, oh, and then and then their they match up with the rest extends of extends them, and it's like that that awareness that they mm -hmm. have or gain or you allow them or help them achieve kind of opens draws the blinds up a little bit, and mm -hmm. then they realize now that they accept it, they're a big bigger part of this uh, spiritual world. Yeah. And That's similarly, it. too, like um, sometimes you'll be working with uh, earthbound spirits so that were human, you know, we called ghost, um, and they will be next to the light and have no idea that there's a light there that's open for them and they can't they see can't, it. They can't see it. They can't sense it. Right. But then once you kind of like talk them through it and they have that realization, that dawning, then they can see it suddenly. So mm -hmm. it kind of depends. Um, on kind of where they're at personally with it a lot of the time, I believe. That's a fair and great answer. Thank you. I have a question. Have you ever been on an investigation where there have been multiple types of spirits and were they aware of each other or 
Well, they did you have to kind of like let them know like, hey, you're a human spirit, but there is an earth spirit here. And how did they react to that? Um, I do find that most of the time they're aware of each other. So um, when we went to one house there, we went to a house where they had a, this natural spring in the basement. And they also had a very powerful human spirit that was there kind of watching over the place. And there was an inhuman spirit that liked to hang around the spring in the basement, but it didn't come upstairs. And I was talking with the human spirit and I'm like, do you know that thing's down there? And she's like, yeah. And it better stay down there. Like she was like, she was the reason it was in the basement. <laughs> so, so I have had that happen. Um, I have Our also space come across space. <laughs> I've also come across, um, spirits that i refer to as collectors which are some of the most unnerving encounters that i've had where you have inhuman spirits that are collecting human spirits that are stuck on our side um that's a real uncomfy thing to come across um, but it does happen so they, they do interact with one another and they are aware of one another most of the time Gra- granted that the spirit has the level of clarity necessary that's fair <laughs> that's the best of spirits <laughs> no, that's well, really I'm, interesting I'm your... um what would you say is the percentage as far as you know going into a house expecting to see or exp- you know interact with a human spirit and then uh you know maybe there's a nature spirit or even a, a demon or a chthonic spirit as we call it um are that is that pretty rare or is it more common than people think um, it's very common to have multiple types of hauntings happening at once. Um, as far as the prevalence of things like uh, negative entities or darker entities or things like that, um, I would say it's pretty common, but I want to add the caveat to that, that my my pool for this kind of uh, poll taking here um, is specifically homes that I've been called to because scary stuff is happening in them. So of, of the number of houses I get called to, it's fairly common to have some sort of an entity situation happening in there. As far as like homes in general, I wouldn't say it's super common to have that. Um, but as far as like hauntings are concerned, um, I do often find that there are multiple levels of things that are happening or multiple layers. So it's very common for me to walk into a home where their problem is actually something that's happening with the land, but there's also a ghost in the house. They're not necessarily causing the activity, but like, you know, Dorothea, who built the house, is still like hanging out. Um, so there's there's often multiple things that are happening at once. Um, it also depends, too, on the family structure, whether or not we have poltergeists, what the ages are of the people, what, what they're going through. Um, so there will often be multiple layers to the haunting. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a couple ways that that works out. So a lot of times when um, people are faced with what I call a negative entity, it's not because that that entity is upset or angry or anything like that. It's simply because this is how the spirit functions. Very similarly to the spider does not eat the fly because it hates flies. It's just what it does. Right. It's in its nature. Yeah, it's, it's its nature. It, that's how it gets absolutely. food, is by scaring people and feeding on that energy. Um, similarly, though, I have had activity that seems very scary, but it's a little bit of a misunderstanding. Um, I had um, a spirit that actually, it's one of my more touching stories of the spirit crossing over, but I, I was working with a spirit at this old homestead property where the spirit had actually been buried on the property um, and no one had really known that this person had existed in life um, they were kind of kept a little hush hush because this person was i believe what we would call today um intellectually disabled i think is, is the most graceful way to say that nowadays um and <laughs> the the activity they were having was 
terrifying the family because um, they had a newborn baby. And it was oh yeah, that's got to be was happening around the baby. Difficult. Like it would pick up the crib and move it several like inches at a time. Like it, it was really freaking out this family because they're like something is coming after the baby. Right, and, and of like, course then all hold bars at that point. Like you're scared, but now you're like this is the most serious thing we could deal with. And it's, right, when something is just, like it's not in our nature. Like if something messes with our kid and we can't see what it is, you're gonna get right. in the highest defensive mode and assume the absolute worst. Right, and this person, the spirit wasn't trying to harm the baby, but they didn't like the baby. The baby made so much noise and it was really like overstimulating for them. So they were just like trying to move it and like put it somewhere else. <laughs> and so it wasn't this malicious attack. They were just like, I don't like this. Can can we get this out of here? Like, cause this is, is too much. Like I like it in your house, but your kid cries a lot, man. <laughs> right. So like, and then, you know, we had the most lovely crossing over with this, with this spirit, this guy, cause one thing that we can do sometimes when when the spirit is is very um, afraid to cross over when they're like you know a lot of times they'll be really afraid of the light so we'll ask that someone that they loved and that they trusted who's on the other side you know come through and kind of escort them through so that they have someone there with them that's already seen the other side and can take them and so we often ask them like okay so who's on the other side that would you know that you trust and that you love who who could help you and both me and this other psychic who I was working in tandem with at that time get the same thing at the same time. And it was the sweetest thing ever. This was the first time anyone had said a dog. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> stop. That is adorable. Uh, that is, that is very cute. It was this guy's buddy, this little black dog. And so we asked and this dog comes through and they were so stoked to see one another. And he just goes right on through. And I thought that, that was the most beautiful thing ever i, I never that really that did make my heart warm just hearing about that story like, right and i'm and just, like, just it's just yeah. misunderstood now just a kind of just a quick note on that i don't know and i maybe I have nothing to base this on but i feel like dogs specifically that befriend us and you know dogs are on a level if you want to call it psychic and awareness of spiritual at least a lot of them that I feel like dogs just know a whole lot more than we do at any given time, especially about dogs, cats, too, like most mm -hmm. animals, but especially dogs when it comes to their idea, because dogs are big on their home and their territory and their family. Like, I don't think anything gets past canines. I don't think anything gets past cats either, but they're just like, oh, whatever, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, well, it's in the corner, it's still my house. But uh, dogs must be so wonderful at, you know, what you just said, like guiding a spirit to where mm -hmm. it needs to go. Like, I feel like there's not any learning curve for a dog, even when it's in spiritual form or it's passed on. Like, it just, mm -hmm. it must have that same beeline. Like, you know, you've heard stories of dogs being lost and they will go, you know, a thousand miles and find their owner. I can't, you know, you've heard stories like that and it was really heartwarming. Yeah. You know, you have a dog spirit that's on the other side and coming through. It probably is... There's, there's probably no issue, you know, needing to find a human that it's known. It, it's just that that thought I hadn't really thought of before, and it was really heartwarming. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we have, um, me and Octavian, and he has had some other guests on, you know, his podcast, and in some of the periphery podcasts that we like to listen to. But black dogs are actually like the spiritual being black dogs. You mentioned a black dog, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. But, you know, they pop up a lot, and I think they're fascinating. Have you ever heard of that? Um, the phenomenon? Or the uh, type of spirit called? Um, yeah. Well, spiritual what's funny, kind of on the, on the topic of, you know, dogs being involved in, in the paranormal, um, we actually, a while ago, decided to add this, this woman to our paranormal team, who I, I've known for a long time, but she's an animal communicator. She's, she's a pet psychic. And Interesting. I will I will admit that I was very skeptical of what she would be offering on a paranormal investigation team where I was right, like, like, okay, okay like, you can talk to dogs and that's really awesome. But like, yeah, I'm not like, really talking like, to dogs. Yeah, I'm like, I, 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 I have respect and I very much believe that you, you can do this. Let me tell you, the next like week or so we had a case 
And we always do this thing that we call pre-impressions, which is we'll either get like a photo of the house or something like that. And and we all kind of, without talking to one another, we kind of write down what it is that we're picking up, what we think is happening. And we send it to our case manager who who collects all of them and and the the psychics don't talk. This woman... Kind of like a blind. Yeah. This woman went from a distance, spoke to uh, the family dog remotely and the dog mm-hmm. gave her all the details. Who was in the home? How many people were there? Um, you know, how many men, women, children? Um, what the spirits were? What the activity had been? She nailed it down to the very last detail because the dog told her everything. And I was so blown away. Oh, that's so, so cool. Impressed. Yeah, that dog's just like, oh, you just wanted to know that? Oh, yeah, here. The dog's that's, like, let me tell you the go. deets because it has <laughs> so been weird cool. around here. Well, that's a really cool point. And one that I wanted to ask you about, you know, in uh, Ceremonial Magic, one of the interesting aspects of it is a lot of the magic that people know about uh, has been transmitted to them by a spirit in a way of like, you know, uh, you ask the spirit how you can contact them further or how you can do this, and they give you a method of doing so. And I'm curious if you've ever been on an investigation where you've asked one of the spirits of the house, you know, how can I talk to you easier? What's a what's a method you would approve of uh, in contacting you? Hmm. I have not yet. Um, I have asked that with, like, um, my my personal spirits that I work with and I have gotten some interesting things, but maybe, maybe that's something to experiment with a yeah. little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I just love the idea of magic being transmitted to humans by spirits for spirits. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, also on that note, what has been, I guess, have you ever experienced a response by the spirits about you using your techniques in their environment where for for however many years, the only people that were coming in there talking to them were using all material methods, such as, you know, traditional ghost hunting methods. You know, when you came in there with your psychic abilities and your magic, were they surprised or did they have a reaction to that at all? Oh, no, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little like um, like Beetlejuice where the guy starts doing the thing because at first they're like curious and then, and then they're like, oh, no. Um, so it kind of it kind of depends. And the spirit world does talk. So I have I found you. that sometimes when I go to places or whatever, they already know who I am, um, which is interesting. Um, it it kind of depends on what it is that I'm doing and, and kind of what methods I'm using. I have realized that when, and I guess this is like more of a traditional ghost hunting equipment thing, but um, when you get out like a, a spirit box, a crowd gathers. They like, want to talk. Yeah, they show up. And that's something, too, and that's a good point, too, that that they do want to communicate. Um, because a lot of witches, for some reason, think that all paranormal investigation is is harassment and and very bothersome to these spirits that, that don't want to communicate. And I'm like, first of all, they very much want to communicate. And anyone who has grown up with any sort of mediumship abilities will tell you that the spirits don't <laughs> leave you alone. They, they want to communicate. You, know, you, you don't want to. Like, But hey, hey yeah. just quick message. Message. You're like, yeah, I'm sleep, just telling man. Aunt Tilly that the will's in the closet. I'm like, I don't even know who Aunt Tilly is. Please go away. Um, <laughs> well, maybe so. it's probably from that that the preconception. I mean, I'm sure we all. It's the first thing that pops into in, into mind for a lot of people in this field is, you know, maybe the the public impression is is like a loud plumber screaming at, at walls. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Very much so. Ric Flair screaming and the ghosts in the other room. He's like, I, 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 I'll leave if you do. Like, <laughs> but, well, that you know that brings up an interesting point and one that I wanted to ask you about because uh, a lot of people who see the more uh, aggro methods of contacting spirits, they just think, oh, that's some dude bro who you know wants to you know piss him off to get activity. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize, and this is something that I found out. Uh, somewhat recently about uh, when you talk about necromancy and like traditional necromancy one of the sort of tried and true methods of doing so is to uh, basically rouse the spirit through aggression 
to get it to do something. And this goes back to a, a very old aspect of necromancy that the only spirits that can be contacted are the restless dead. So someone who is uh, at peace it would be much harder, if not impossible, to get in contact with them because they aren't here anymore. Restless spirits, mm-hmm. one of the reasons they're restless is because they're still here. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's interesting to see this sort of, um, these techniques that are historical, going back thousands and thousands of years, uh, such as you know pissing off the spirits to get them to do something, <laughs> is still being done today without people's real uh, you know knowledge of it they don't realize that what they're uh, you know practicing and, and what they're participating in is a very old form of magic yeah or even that like is folk true. magic too so one of the things that i was learning with my first book was i i sat down for that book and talked to a lot of people about kind of like you know their customs you know being mexican-american all this stuff and one of the things that i we'd often talk about would be ghosts and I and I'd be like, okay, so like, what were you know your beliefs around ghosts? And a shocking amount of the people that I spoke to were like, well, I was always told that if I was faced with a ghost and I needed it to go away, that there was two ways to do so. And I'm like, okay. And everyone had the same two, which is either you you pray like you you, you say an, an Our Father or like a Hail Mary, or you cuss it out. And those were the two methods yes. of defending <laughs> yourself against a spirit. Was you either just light it up, yeah, or, no, like I, or you say a prayer? And no, I you know just personally, I can attest it's that some is sometimes very effective. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's because we go back to spirits communicating intent, and I think um, yeah. like when we give when we give emotion into our words or our action, like I think that carries energy and weight on a spiritual plane so if you have that just pent up aggression and you can you know that spirit's there even if you can't sense it maybe you don't even believe in it just like a a non-magical person and like you said just coming at it with a barrage of like you know rah, and yeah, and cursing it out is, lighting is up, like it, you know that that probably on a spiritual level it feels that it can definitely like whoa push it back a couple feet so to speak and uh, at least make it pay attention and, and feel that aggression the same way perhaps a spirit would an angry you know an angry or uh, a confused spirit in a house might make the people around it who live in that house feel similar emotions or certain ways absolutely uh now you know we're getting into the last 30 minutes of the uh the interview but one thing i want to ask you and this kind of goes back to uh ian bringing up the black dogs you know there's a lot of phenomena well i think when people think of the paranormal they only associate that with ghosts and demons. Like, that's it. Everything yeah, else is a separate too, thing. Yeah. And I'm curious about if you've ever interacted with um, other phenomenon that may not traditionally be classed as pheno- as paranormal, but still, in my opinion, is. So, you know, I'm going to go there. Bigfoot and cryptids and things like that that do seem to have this very physical flesh and blood aspect to them but then also have both um spiritual and non-physical attributes as well as uh connections to mythology and folklore Mm -hmm. i'm curious about your uh your experiences with those so i've had two two um really kind of sturdy ones in that category um I guess the first one's kind of a little bit of a shorter story. Um, we were called to a house in Lower Washington, where this man had bought or had built this beautiful home in the forest. And in order to do so, he had to cut down a lot of trees in this area. And the Pacific Northwest has a lot going on in the foresting area, um, and. He did not make friends with that action. And when he contacted our team, he included a picture of something that had been left on his porch. And what it looked like was something had come up onto his porch and thrown up some sort of piece of animal onto the porch. And it, it was like... It was like that this animal had like a belly full of blood and something else in it that it threw up onto the porch. And so it's like all this blood and this weird, 
limb of something. We're still not sure. So yeah, it's it's the thing you you wake up you you walk out of your house in the morning and that's the first thing you see and you're like oh yeah. I see. It was a message because it was like directly in front of his front door, and it was early summer, so it had been hot, and we weren't able to get there for like a week or so after he contacted us because you know we have to all arrange our schedules and find out the day that we can all go and blah blah blah. And so um, the day we get there, it's. Still on his, he had, he had picked up the thing, but like the actual like blood portion of it was still on the porch. Should have been dry by then because it had been hot and sunny. It was still wet, which it was is, still just kind of existing in the in. Mm-hmm. Oh wow, that's which is a bit of an indication of some yeah afoot because normally those things should go through natural decay processes, and when they don't, that's a little bit of a flag that something is up. And we began talking with him about the activity that he had been seeing. And he had been experiencing um, seeing these really large Bigfoot type encounters. Um, But they were like the shadow version of Bigfoot because he's like, they, they're, it's not like a, a physical thing so much, but he's like, but I see it directly right. in my physical yeah, eyes. He's like, but it's not a hairy creature. He's like, it's a, like big a silhouette black almost. shadow. Yeah, like a silhouette that's yeah. standing in his driveway. And, and that's that's actually very common. Mm-hmm. And he said that like, like it had red eyes and it was like the, it looked like Bigfoot, but it was all black and shadow. And mm-hmm. he had a, a grandson that used to come and stay with him. And his grandson's room that he had made for him and all that was on the second floor. And his grandson had been waking up in the middle of the night screaming because one of those things was tall enough to be looking in his room, in his window. So he'd be waking up because this thing was looking in. Um, So he had several encounters with some stuff from the forest that was not happy with him. (laughs) If that tracks, and that's always, that has to be so unsettling for the people experiencing it. it. And it happens so much. Um, And it's interesting how when you have you know one of the um the lessons that i've learned while doing this podcast comes from a good friend of mine sorry Azkath, who does uh where did the road go podcast and he's always talking about intellectual honesty in investigating and so mm-hmm. especially when it comes to bigfoot and cryptids if you're out in the woods and you don't see anything but you hear tree knocks or you get a stone thrown at you or you hear uh some sort of strange cry or or, you know moan um and a lot of people would immediately jump to bigfoot but because Mm -hmm. you didn't see that it was a bigfoot you can't honestly say that that was a bigfoot because if you were in a house you would say it was a ghost right exactly a lot of a lot of the it's uh environmental the fact that, you know, people tend to have associations with different environments and situations. Mm-hmm. So you're in a house, it's a ghost or a poltergeist or right. something like if you're in the woods, it might be a Bigfoot or you see a light, it might be a UFO or, or you right. know, it's that. But if you break down the environmental factors and just kind of observe the phenomenon itself and move mm-hmm. it around, it might be very similar. Without attaching so much stuff yep, to it. Exactly. Yeah. That solely. The... Uh, so, the other one too that i've kind of I, i'm not sure we would call this like cryptid so much as like folkloric spirit sort of situation um one of them that i talk about in the book is is a spirit that i've come to refer to as clyde because i if i if i if i come across a spirit enough times i tend to give it a name oh, i hear that like, <laughs> i'm like well, what up, buddy? i want to know like, about clyde <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm like what's up you're in this house again we got to get you out bro like it, it helps me also like to like keep like the level of fear a little bit lower especially when you're dealing with something that's really messed up but i i began coming across the spirit like the first time it was in um a bar in downtown portland that i was investigating and there was a spirit in there of this guy and he was very well dressed he was in like a suit and tails with the gloves and the spats and the top hat and everything like that yeah yeah whole nine yards whole nine yards and I remember just being like, wow, like you're so snazzy. Um, But then as I'm talking to him, I'm realizing something's not right. That his skin doesn't seem to fit him correctly. That's an interesting, interesting way you describe that. 
because I've yeah. heard that description in kind of different mm-hmm. paranormal scenarios. Yep. Specifically about the skin not fitting right or like yeah. the, it's not layered correctly. Right. Or, I kind of describe it like if yeah. you see the first men in black movie where like the farmer um, has the alien in him and he has to kind of like, <laughs> well, no, no. <laughs> Ironic. You mentioned that because what I had in my mind where you hear that description a lot is actually from the old, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's an entire body of lore surrounding like the real life men in black that the movie. Was oh yeah. Inspired. Mm-hmm. You, and that is actually a where something's always a little skin. off. <laughs> Specifically, their skin, like you know, from the Mothman prophecies, and not just that, but some adjacent Men in Black lore, lore that there's often they're described as something wrong with their skin. Like one of them was described as having only one layer of skin in a weird right. way, and like they didn't really know how to describe that, where their skin didn't fit right, or in almost in some cases they almost looked corpse-like. Mm-hmm. And where you could kind of see through it, and it's just an odd thing, is that that isn't that story isn't really like a Men in Black uh, cryptid story, but it's interesting, like the crossovers, a vibe. the different, yeah, absolutely. It's like the idea that something is pretending to be something else, or it's doing its best. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. But um, I'm kind of noticing this about it, and so I kind of go, oh you're not a human spirit, are you? And he gets real excited that I figured it out. And he gives me this huge smile with all these shark teeth. And I'm like, nope, hate that. Really hate that a lot. And so as the years went on, I began encountering this spirit or a spirit like it. I, I, I call them all Clyde, but they're kind of like a, a type of spirit because I don't generally come yeah. across the same one every time, but they're always um, it's like a tall. Yeah, they're always tall, thin men, really dressed up with top hats or bowler yeah. hats or things like that on. And so eventually I come across it so many times that I was like, I cannot be the only one. So I Google. Oh yeah. I don't think you are it wearing a top hat and boom, pages and pages and pages and pages. Sure you got like of, the hat man lore. And yeah. And yeah. Like the that, hat not man starts that. coming up. And I was like, I didn't even know the hat man was a thing. And until I had been coming across him so many times and then I Google it and like, there's all this stuff. There's books on the hat man, all this stuff. And there's even, so I found that, I believe it's from the Seneca Nation, there's an old Native American legend of something that they called hi-hat. I've heard of hi-hat, yes. a spirit with a stove, stovepipe hat, stovetop hat, stovepipe <laughs> hat. Um, one of those um, that was supposed to be like a, a flesh-eating spirit or whatever, so they would like leave meat or like nail meat to the trees around the, like, the swamp area of where it lived so that it wouldn't come looking for more um, they would kind of feed it so that it would stay over there. Um, and that's very similar to what I would come across because whenever I come across a Clyde, they're always um, dressed similarly, but they also have something going on with the mouth. Um, either they have like really intense jagged teeth or um, sometimes there will even be like deformities, like they'll be missing a lower jaw um, and just mm-hmm. have like a really long tongue situation happening. Um, yes. But it, it would it would make sense. So I, those are kind of my two sort of cryptidy things where I'm like, no, no, thank you. no, that's <laughs> fascinating. And in some that intersects with a lot of a lot of stories and in, in kind of a, a realm of the paranormal, including kind of the men in black lore. But before I, I know uh, Octavian, he was looking at me when you were talking about that, that your Clyde kind of showed shark teeth specifically. I was just telling him a story and I bet he wants me to. To, to tell it to you about an old encounter I had. You remember that? Oh, yeah. I definitely want you to tell that oh, story. Yeah? But before yeah. you do that, okay. I thought the, the intersection there, because um, I am a devotee of Hakate. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, every, on the new moon, we do the, the dipnon, dipnon ritual. And uh, part of that is obviously you, you give an offering of food to her and ask mm-hmm. of something. And then you also give an offering to the restless dead because on the dip on the new moon that is the night that she has the restless dead follow her around and roam the earth and things like that mm-hmm. and the horde. Uh, giving meat and and you know meat food and things like that is a very very common offering for the restless dead 
and entities like that. But yeah, Ian, mm-hmm. you can go ahead and tell your story. Oh yeah, so it just it brought it to mind. I uh, and you know the the idea that spirits like not all of them maybe, but a lot of them like meat. They like blood. Is kind of it's unsettling for some people to think about, but it's it's accurate going all the way back. Um, especially certain types. But yeah, the story, there's a there's an old haunted, kind of like a haunted locale near us in Maryland for me. It's a, and it was, it's a, it's, it's vaguely popular. It's a, it's an old haunted bridge called Jericho Covered Bridge out here in Maryland. And it's, there's no, I don't know if some people have heard of it outside of the state. It's one of the many crybaby bridges in Maryland. Yeah, kind of like a crybaby bridge. It's, it's huh. well, they renovated it, but it's. One of the old, it's the oldest in the state or the area, but beyond that, it's located next to a place called Jerusalem Mill. It's a historic post revolutionary war, you know, kind of like a historic village where they have a blackness shop and they still have the original buildings. And some of them are quite old. And we used to go up there. It's kind of like in the outside of the city proper. So it was a good place to drive around. And it was always very spiritually active and potent. So back in our younger days, you know, it was one of our haunts kind of thing. Because mm. right? I know, you know, when you're kind of like a teen or post teen and you're getting into your initiations and psychic moments, like it's fun. That's what you want to go do a lot. But I remember we were driving in a car. We must have been like 17 years old. We crossed this bridge. And after that, the road goes on and you take a left and it goes into this Jerusalem Mill historic village proper. And the house on the corner used to be an old general store. And it you know, must have been like 300 years old. And I'm sure they've kept it up. But the foundation, so it had a little porch, two stories with a basement. And they had like, you know, the little rectangle windows, you know, in the basement foundation. So we were, it, it had to have been about one in the morning. And we took that left turn. And we kind of all passively kind of looked to our left out of the windows. We were only going about 10 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And we noticed the basement windows were, you know, a lit like somebody had a light on in the basement. Nothing weird. But um, me and my friend who were looking out the window saw it at the same time. We just saw the out, like a little girl in the window very briefly. Mm-hmm. And um, she looked maybe about seven or eight um definitely native american in her features wearing kind of what we could see just just like kind of an old style you know the top of her dress when they saw her head it Mm -hmm. was very quick and but we both pulled because we we both kind of gasped the same time without stating and what we seen we're like and my friend's like what like you see her and for the couple seconds we saw her, looked like her eyes were all black, and then she smiled very broadly. She has what we both described as piranha teeth or shark teeth. Oh and, no! <laughs> and then we're like, "Yo, stop! Like, stop!" And so we stopped. And then, you know, my friend who was driving, who didn't see, he's like, "Oh, what are you guys talking about?" But we told him, he's like, "Okay." So we, you know, within thirty seconds, we had came back around. She was gone. Uh, me and my other friend got out of the car because they were like, that's a little much. So we go to the window and the light was still on uh, and we peek in and the basement was about 10 feet to the floor and it was completely empty. The light was still on. So, you know, it was almost like this, this girl must have been like three or four feet high. She's just a child as what we were looking at, but there was mm-hmm. nothing for anybody to stand up. It was like 10 foot down and of course no sign of it, but that's, that's just a quick encounter from my past that just really reminded me of what you said. That specific like shark or piranha teeth, uh, on oh, a humanoid. No. Fix it. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. This is a long time ago now, but that was, <laughs> that was one of those. Oh, that, that was unsettling, wasn't it? That, <laughs> but, that's a really good transition. Um, when it comes to, I know that your your uh, especially the book is mostly around um, haunted homes, and mm-hmm. and the investigation that you do there. Uh, but I'm curious about what we'll call places uh, places of power or folkloric mm-hmm. places. So you know, uh, legendary crybaby bridges or. Um, forests that are known for a lot of activity have you done any investigations there or has that kind of um played into your experiences at all um i have stopped by some places like that 
um, that are kind of those those hubs <laughs> of that activity. Um, I do think that they're interesting. I don't tend to do any sort of what I would call like resolution type work there to try and fix any of it because I do think that some of these places are important to what I would call sort of the the, the supernatural or, or the paranormal ecology. You know, kind of like if if there was a, a spiritual version of like a wetland or something like habitat or um, and that's kind of what I think about things like um, like the the Cecil Hotel or things like that, where it's like this is some sort of a nexus portal thing. I'm I'm not going to screw with it because I'm thinking that this is probably part of something much bigger. And it's also probably not something that I alone am going to be able to fix. Even me and a whole coven may not be able to fix. So um, I, I tend to think that those things have a purpose of some sort that are, you know, spiritual in nature. Or or at least I would like to think so, because I, I like to have meaning for things. Um, yeah, I do too. Yeah. It gets a, a little tricky when you have things like in like Japan, they have like the suicide forest or whatever, like, because it's like, okay, I don't want to say like, there's a meaning behind all of that. Like, but it's, but these, these places I think have, um, they, they, they do something. I'm not sure what, but there's something. Yeah. There's definitely seems to be almost like overlaid on our landscape, mm-hmm. another landscape for these beings that they all yeah. kind of, um, exist in for one reason or another. And it's interesting because I, you know, in um, in a lot of different magical practices, timing and certain environmental timing, I guess we'll call it, is a big factor. So, you know, within the ceremonial system, you have the planetary days and hours. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of witchcraft circles, you have the moon cycles and things like mm-hmm. that. And I'm curious if you've found... Uh, when you're on an investigation, that timing plays a, a part in it, such as uh, certain spirits are more active at this time or during this moon phase or things like that? Or does that not really factor in? To be honest, I don't really find it to be that much of a factor. Um, and something that I point out in my book as well that I think might throw off a lot of people is um, you don't have to investigate at night. <laughs> or at like 3 a.m. or whatever is like the magical hour when the activity is supposed to happen. If you want to investigate at night, you absolutely can. But I will tell you that the spirits are still there during the day. Um, so I we do most of our investigations during the afternoon. If I'm doing like an exorcism in particular, um, I insist on doing it during the day, um, particularly like during the morning hours. Um, but I, I don't find that there's so much of like a a magical time where we, where we see a big uptick in the activity. Um, sometimes I do feel like, um, there's more activity around like certain times of the year as far as like, I, I always sense when Halloween is coming because this weird stuff starts happening. Like, like recently, like I live in this neighborhood with a lot of elderly people and I haven't really ran into any of them until like a week ago. There's this guy who looks like the preacher from the second poltergeist movie that's decided that me and my dog are hilarious. And so like now, like (laughs) every time I take my dog for a walk, he's just out front, just looking all crazy. Like, ha ha, I love you and your dog. And I'm like, Oh, there's, there's Halloween, you know, (laughs) like it's coming. Like stuff just gets weird around this time of year. And so I I do think that there's something to be said about like certain times of the year, but um, not necessarily as far as like moon cycles or, or anything like that is concerned. Interesting. It it definitely, it definitely seems to be um, very apparent in its use in certain circles and certain phenomena. And then others, it just doesn't seem to matter. I noticed, you know, all of my strange, we'll call them Bigfoot adjacent encounters have been during the day. Um, most recently, uh, in an area that I go to a lot specifically because I know that there is stuff there. Um, I was sitting there, I was only there 20 minutes, and you can probably attest to this. You know, sometimes uh, the the activity could be, maybe it itself is not super terrifying, but when you're there alone, like, you got to know when you can handle it and when you can't. 
Um, yeah. Because I was only there 20 minutes and I sat down in the woods at a pavilion and I noticed to my uh, my right there was what we would call rock clacking and it's a very specific sound. It's very sharp. Um, and then a stone was very clearly thrown at me and landed about three feet in front of my feet. And I was like, okay. You know, I'm here by myself. I didn't bring anything with me. I think I'm I'm okay for the day. But that was uh, uh, I was actually in the day and hour of Mercury uh, at like two thirty to three thirty in the afternoon. And I've had other experiences there with sounds and things like that during the day. Um, one of the my, my nose one of my most notable experiences. I was with Timothy Renner from the Strange Familiars podcast, explaining to him one of the encounters I had. And then during that day we were followed around by this very, very strange tapping noise, and it would respond to us. That was like from noon to five o'clock during the day. So yeah, it, it is interesting how this stuff really, it happens during the day just as much, if not more, at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm always, you know, I have a very low threshold for things like that with like the Bigfoot, where I'm like, cool, heard a knocking sound, gonna go now. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you're you're alone in the woods, and it's something like it could be something like a Bigfoot or a large creature that is physically there. It becomes that's a whole new dimension <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways because you don't know what it is, but it certainly seems to know you. <laughs> I did once sit on a panel with a woman who was a a bona fide um, Sasquatch communicator. She was a Bigfoot psychic. That was interesting. I'm like, I would like to speak with you more because that I I want to know things. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I think that the the psychic phenomena could be heavily utilized in Bigfoot mm-hmm. and other cryptid activity because, like I said, like you know they do appear in flesh and blood instances, but they seem to respond to a lot more spiritual techniques to contact them. And I think mm-hmm. that it's really important to get into that territory because. For you know, since the the uh, well, you know the the Patterson Gimlin film, mm-hmm. which came out in sixty seven, which was a big. I mean, it really kicked off the Bigfoot phenomena in the sense of people going looking for it. When mm-hmm. you watch these shows, and it's very similar to ghost stuff. It's like ten or twelve guys in camo, just banging on trees and yelling. And whether or not it's a magical creature, it's going to yeah. be annoyed it's not going to interact with someone like that right it it just has no patience for that and so i think bringing in whether it be ceremonial magic or psychic and mediumship i think these are going to be very important in getting more useful encounters and information from these kind of things um we're coming down to the last five minutes uh ian did you have anything else you wanted to add I did actually had a couple question lines, but I'll make it quick since we only have a little bit of time. Um, ooh, I guess my first question is pretty quick. You work with with guide spirits, friendly spirits that are, you know, hang with you, correct? Mm-hmm. Could, yeah. Are you allowed to tell us a little bit about them? Oh, sure. Um, so I have one that helps me in particular um, with mediumship. And um, I, I I do like working with her a lot. And it's funny because, um, you know, sometimes your guides are human spirits that were, that were people. And sometimes they're kind of other things. Um, right. That's my experience, too. Well. <laughs> um, and she was a, a human at one point. And um, I guess still is. She's, she's a human spirit. But uh, she was a switchboard operator in the UK back when... That's how they used to do, like, telephones. Right, so you uh, plug the wire in, pull it yeah. out, transfer. And I thought that that was perfect for her assisting me with mediumship. Right, like when you said that, I was like, here, that connect your call, and I was like, excellent. So um, I love working with her. Um, I have a, uh, a guardian angel that I have a very close relationship with that I work with. Um, made, made a lot of sense when I figured that out. And I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Um, right. And then I have another one that kind of assists me with the witchcraft. And um, they're not a human spirit necessarily. They're kind of like a um, uh, an amalgamation of a couple of other things. Um, guides are like that. We're like, right. like, so what are you? They're like, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm like, 
I don't know if you have words to describe it, but just right. go on. And I asked <laughs> them, helpful. like, what's your name? And they're like, my name is Brian. And I'm like, Brian? I'm like, what? And they're like, they're like, well, technically you couldn't even pronounce it if I told you, but right. this is the you name. don't have you don't vocal have cords that can do negative <laughs> connotations to this name. So we've chosen this one. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, all right. Um Yeah. And that I know when I when I was younger and working with spirits originally, sometimes that would be something that boggled me. Like you'd have this an entity that is far more than just like a ghost. Mm-hmm. And then it gives you like a you know, a relatively simple, silly name, and you're like Really? Is this is this, this me? Red, and then, <laughs> and, you know, later on, you know, you, you've asked and I've got that response. You're like, well, it, it this name is kind of personifying a lot of your association with it. Yeah. To kind of what I represent. And also, like, this is just what I want you to call me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, who I really am isn't really a name like Brian, but... Mm-hmm. You just don't have any problems <laughs> with anybody being Brian, so right. <laughs> you have English, so we're going to, have to I, uh, work on that. I had a, I have a friend who has actually been on the podcast, and he is a psychic medium. And I was doing a session with him where he was trying to contact whatever came through for me. And uh, we got this woman who said she was part of my family. Never really figured out who it was because I kept asking for a name. Please just give me your name, and that would really help me connect you to someone in my family. And he says she doesn't. She, that's not what she wants. She doesn't want you to have her name. I'm like okay. How? What can you give me a name I can use to invoke you when I'm doing my meditation or, or anything like that? So that way I can contact you directly. And uh, he said she wants you to call her Helen. I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, is that your name? She's. He's like, no, that's not her name, but that's what she wants you to like. You know, yeah. that's what she wants you to call her. And right. so it's interesting how you know names, and that goes back to a names lot of power. Old, old lore, because especially in Egypt, you know. When a baby was born, the only person who could know their real name was the mother. Everyone else had to use another name. So, right. uh, and names do have power. You know, you can bind anything once you have their real name. Uh, so, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, it's not such a weird thing. Humans do it all the time, especially now. All of us have screen names. Many right. people have nicknames. And a lot of people in the magical community, they have monikers that they go by. Mm-hmm. And so it's, why wouldn't spirits do it? Like, you know, just have your pure, true given name says a lot about your identity. And the idea of a true name that you can, well, control, but not necessarily, you know, you, you have something's full attention. You can see it's more like its totality when you know you have its true name i think for spirits like their true name is something less of a a physical name and more like something that describes their uniqueness Mm -hmm. beyond any other spirit like it's their core like when you talk about the goetia or other spirits that have sigils Mm -hmm. that they're kind of like that is kind of like a representation of their true name it's like their character their Mm -hmm. who they are what they are um, but I did actually have another question. So we're, we're running low on time. You do um, pendulum divination, correct? And you use mm-hmm. it with your work. And yeah. I do too. It's something that I've spent a lot the last couple of years really trying to refine. And I was listening to you on another podcast and I was absolutely fascinated by your take and how similar it was to kind of what I was learning kind of from the spirit most in, in general, just over time. But uh, I have a question for you. Like you... Do you use a pendulum regularly? Um, not usually anymore. Um, I offer it uh, in the book as something that is helpful if you're not super confident in the psychic ability right. so much. Um, but for me, it's something that I'm like when I'm when I'm in a haunted home, it's it's usually me trying to like <laughs> parse it out a little bit more that I having something some other avenue for it to try and communicate. Yes with me is, is all just too much at that point. Um, so if there's something in the home that I need to find, maybe like I'll utilize the pendulum. But uh, nowadays I tend to rely just, mostly on the psychic skills, though right. I do use a pendulum as a projective tool and not just a receptive tool. So like I'll utilize pendulums to close portals, um, things like that as well, um, which I talk about in the book too. So people forget that pendulums aren't just to receive information, but they're also, um, they also you, can, you can utilize them. So. Absolutely. I know um, one of the avenues that I work with mine, and you're right, like the pendulum is a tool and just kind of like language and words like we were talking about earlier. I always look at it like it's a third step that if, when you get, you know, you have the spirit in, in its information and you have you and your information and you translate because that's how humans talk. 
You know, mm-hmm. we have to translate our intent and idea into a language, and then it has to be intaken and then retranslated into the idea for the second person. And spirits mm-hmm. generally don't have to do that. They don't need to. They don't need that third step. They can just do talk or right. you know pass the information. But um, part of the work that I've done with a pendulum specifically is a crystal. Have you ever heard of the idea of you know a spirit residing in a stone? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I guess anything like the idea of an idol, but have you ever had a pendulum or something like it where an individual spirit has either existed in it or has been invited into it or is kind of awoken from it that you've then been able to work with? Um, I've always kind of gone with the animistic perspective that all things contain a spirit. Same. That's um, exactly my position. And well. so it's a little less that there's like, this is Samuel. He lives inside my crystal, but it's more like, you know, this crystal has its own spirit. Um, and so working with it in, in that capacity, yes. Um, yeah. Right. No, that's fair. Like I have a, I call, you know, I'm the, I'm the same exact way and I've done classes on pendulum divination and really it is kind of in the end a step up where you don't, you won't need it after a certain point except for when you want to. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I kind of call the a spirit that dwells in mine, you know, kind of tongue in cheekly my familiar because she serves as an intermediary mm-hmm. and it's conversational. I know when usually when I do it by myself, it's kind of it's an intent based communication that sometimes, you know, we just stop using that. And I even get the in, in, in the mind. It's like, you know, it's kind of just a comfort habit thing. And then we'll just kind of start talking. But mm-hmm. on that note, I, working with a crystal in the spirit and again i agree with you 100 percent on the animistic nature everything has a spark in it do you think those small little spirits and objects say a crystal i i think that they grow and can evolve and learn from us in working with us in the same way with it we can learn from them do you think spirits like that and i guess you have personal experience with it do you think they can grow I don't want to say smarter, but they can kind of evolve a little bit and learn from us and become greater spirits or more capable spirits over time the more we work with them and the more work they do. As in, like, you know, if you take a pendulum crystal, it's it's the spirit of the stone. It's like a little shard of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have an amethyst stone and kind of talking to her, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I was part of this big amethyst geode. And now, you know, I'm just kind of like a part of it. But over time... In working with that, she became far more defined and capable and kind of developed more of a personality over time and an understanding. And her abilities on doing divination and being able to communicate with other spirits and be predictive and things like that seemed to increase as I worked with her. Not only my own techniques, but her objective abilities. Have you ever noticed anything like that? Do you have any comments on maybe helping a spirit of a tool or in general grow over time based on your connection with it. Um, I do think that that is something that happens. And I do think that kind of anytime we have experiences with each other, you know, we, we can both grow. Um, And I think there's something to be said for your relationship with that spirit growing and that affecting um, how well things go and how clear things are. Um, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say that I have taught the spirit so much now they're better for knowing me. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't mean to I, think I, that I do, more like... I, I would like to think that sometimes, but uh, I'm not I'm not sure that that's necessarily always how it works. They have an unfortunate um, knowledge of pop culture that it didn't have before. Right, exactly. <laughs> don't know if it's good or not. And but. it has a lot of really weird references that it knows. But, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it does enjoy that. Um, so I, I do think that over time, you know, things like that can grow. And I, I do think that's really great when it does happen. Well, Jay, I really, really want to thank you for coming on. And we have so much more to talk about. So we'll absolutely have to have you back on the show. Can you let everyone know where they can find you and your book and your podcast, by the way? Absolutely. So again, I'm Jay Allen Cross. You can find my book pretty much wherever books are sold. Uh, My first book, American Brujeria, is out from Wiser. And then um, my new book, The Witch's Guide to the Paranormal, is also out from Llewellyn. Um, You can find them on Amazon, all over the place. Um, and you can find me mostly on the Instagram. I am at Oregon underscore wood underscore witch. So I'm Oregon wood witch. Um, make sure that you have the correct number of underscores and one of the O's isn't a zero because a lot of people are pretending <laughs> to be me online right now. I'll make sure to link um, it in the show notes. 
Great. Thank you very there much. Was really wonderful. There's no, only there's only one a, meme. Thank it was, you so much. It was much. absolutely wonderful meeting you. And again, I've been kind of deep diving into your into your work lately. I have your new book on order. Hey. We didn't have we didn't have enough time uh, for me, but I, I wanted to ask you about uh, your original book, American Bohemia, on uh, maybe another time. And as a <laughs> lesson, I did I did throw you an ad, um, Ian Burton on Facebook. If you want to accept me, that'd be cool. I wanted to talk to you earlier about a couple things, but uh, anyway, in whatever format, I'd love to communicate with you again, whether on here or in passing, because you are a wealth of information. And uh, you know, I think anybody who comes across to you and talks to you or reads your work is going to learn a lot of you know both theory and especially practice. So thank you for joining us, and it was an absolute pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. you have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Good night. That was our interview with J. Allen Cross. I really enjoyed hearing him talk about the different kinds of entities that he encounters. Uh, the Clyde spirit was a very, very interesting one to me, and the intersection between that and some of your stories, Ian, was a really, it, it was a lot of fun to listen to you guys talk and, uh, you know, go back and forth with your different encounters. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to get him on here again and dig more into, especially just some of his personal encounters and experiences over the years and some of the details on how he utilizes uh, magic with spirits in his investigations and also why he does what he does. Like I love to get some ins. I, I love to hear his uh, side of it, like why he does what he does and why he feels called to do it. And not only is it, you know, a practice, something to do, but something that has, you know, spiritual meaning to who he is and really the foundation because he wants to help people. Absolutely. And that's something Honestly, many people who practice witchcraft or the occult, they should focus on that foundation. Like, if you can do magic, you should use it to help people. Absolutely. And we'll be having him back on to talk about his other book, American Bruharia, and whatever else he puts out. So, as always, we will see you again on The Strange Dominions.